Recursive data structures are the secret behind every powerful application that you use on your computer, your phone, or your gaming console. What do we mean by a recursive data structure? Well, imagine we're trying to model a sequence of courses that you might take in a row. And like right now, you're in a course whose number is 110. And then after that, there's going to be another course uh, that might be 210. And after that, there might be another course that's 211. And these are the course numbers at UNC. And eventually, somewhere, this, this chain of courses must end or terminate, right? Well, this idea that one node or one object can refer to another object of the exact same type is what makes this a recursive structure. Let's look at how we can define this kind of structure in the context of Python. So imagine we've got a, instead of naming our class class and saying we've got a class class, let's call one of these a node. And this is a commonly used phrase or, or term in a data structure where we've got a node in some list uh, uh, of, that's linked together. And it's got a data attribute, okay, that's gonna be the course number. And then notice what is special about this particular class and what makes this a recursive data type is the fact that this node attribute has a net, uh, sorry, this next attribute is of type node. It's of the same type that this attribute is the class defined in. And so here we've got a next that can hold a reference to another node object. And that's pretty profound, right? That's what makes this a recursive data type. If we were to imagine this a little bit more concretely, as we would on a uh, memory diagram, and we think about our objects like we were thinking about modeling before in sort of a, uh, a loosely drawn diagram, here we can imagine, okay, uh, we do have node objects, and next is going to be a reference to or a pointer to another node object. And um, you can sort of... Uh, Imagine that this chain goes as long as you want it to go. You can continue uh, conjoining nodes to uh, subsequent nodes which follow. And that's one of the keys of recursion or recursive data types. You can continue to compose larger and larger structures by combining them together. So at some point we need to know how do we stop this from being in a, uh, an infinitely recursive data type? Because as it's defined, how do we know if, if a next always has to be another node, when does it end, right? That's a valid question to be wondering at this point. And we don't yet have the answer to that. But before we worry ourselves on that, let's think about recursive data structures a little bit more generally uh, and have some context. And then we'll go play with how we can uh, terminate a recursive data structure in our code. In this course, we're looking specifically at a singly linked list to get some practice with both recursive data structures, but also recursive processes. And the best way in my mind to learn how to write recursive functions is to write them in terms of data structures, which have some shape and feel to them, which is a little bit more concrete than just numbers or strings, right? And this aligns with how you'll tend to use recursion in the real world in projects and applications that you wanna build. If you need to write a recursive function, it's probably to work with a recursive data structure. Now in the following course, in Comp 210, you'll look at more complex recursive data structures where you can form things like trees. And so notice in this class, which I've named something different, I've named element, notice it has two attributes, which are of type element, that allows it to have a, a left, if we're thinking in terms of directionality, a left side and a right side. And this might be how you form a tree of nodes where each, each object in your tree can refer to two other nodes and there's branches that allow it to expand out. You can imagine that each node is able to store more than two, might have a list of other nodes of the same type. And if you're thinking about things like a social network or uh, other problems like traveling around a map in, in a city and creating circuits, uh, graphs wind up being something that are another recursive data structure where you've got vertices and edges connecting those vertices and how you model those and think about those relationships uh, can often be done in a recursive nature. All right. So this linked list that we're focused on in this course and in this lesson specifically is pretty straightforward. We're going to use a term that is going to be, uh, when we say that we're talking about the head of a linked list, we're talking about a reference to the first node. This terminology is uh, common when you're working with lists. And when we think of this as uh, when we have the head of a list, we're, it's, it's a reference to the very first node. We're going to see somehow, and I'm in the way of this, but somehow we're able to represent and end a list with no value at all. 
That's how we'll terminate a list, and we'll see how that's done in just a moment while still maintaining strong typing. What I want to say before we get there, though, are some caveats about linked lists. So first, as we know, we're going to be able to build up these lists by chaining them together and by adding more nodes uh, one after the other uh, to the next node that comes before it. You're probably already getting a sense that this feels more complicated and perhaps cumbersome to work with than the list that's built into Python that you've been working with this entire course and that you know and love at this point, right? A list you can append to, you can pop from, you've got all these built-in methods, you can index it in really nice ways. It turns out for most problems that you want to solve uh, and that we've been solving all course long, a list is the right way to go. And working with a linked list and a data structure like this that's recursive in nature and, and pretty simplistic in the way that we're going to be processing it is much more cumbersome. There's, there's just no way around it, right? So you're probably run, wondering like, well, why in the heck are we spending time learning this? Well, a linked list, as we're going to be studying it, turns out to be, I think, the best means for getting more comfortable thinking in terms of recursive processes and functions, uh, as well as getting some practice understanding references and how you build uh, graphs of, of nodes of ob or graphs of objects together, and for understanding this concept of none in Python, which is also called null in some other languages, if you may have seen it, or if you continue on, you'll see uh, null in, in other uh, languages like Java. And so, uh, this is a tool that we're using sort of a, as a sandbox for practicing understanding the concepts uh, that we're learning. And even though a singly linked list is probably not something that's going to be your go-to solution to a program that you want to solve in the near future, um, it's the best way to learn these concepts uh, without it being overwhelmingly confusing about lots of other details. We're minimizing the details that we need to worry about by simplifying the data structure to something very, very simple, a singly linked list. So that way the focus and the emphasis can be on the recursive uh, nature of our algorithms and the functions that we write, as well as how we think about references between objects. All right. So what is a recursive attributes base case? And, and the answer is actually already revealed on the slide in terms of a strongly typed Python program. Well, we want to be able to make that next attribute optional, right? We want to be able to say, hey, it's either a node or it's nothing at all. And when it's nothing at all, that means you've reached the end of a list, of a linked list, and, and there's no more nodes for you to process at this point, right? So when you ask the question of if each node refers to another node, when does it end? Well, it ends when the next attribute of some node in our class node uh, refers to none and, and doesn't refer to any other node whatsoever. Right? So we think about the terminating case or the base case of a recursive data structure as when there's just no more references to other objects that are a part of our recursive data structure to go process. Why don't we go ahead and uh, start to model this out in VS Code together? So I'm going to have you start a Python program and naming it ls43 uh, underscore linked list is a great name for this and putting it in your lessons directory. And we're going to go ahead and import from future the ability to write classes who have type annotations that reference the class, some attribute, parameter, return type is, is defined. And so we've seen this before, uh, but this first line is kind of funky. We're saying we're importing a feature from the future version of Python uh, in order to make uh, this, this type of a, a declaration. Right? We're also going to import from typing uh, the idea of an optional data type. So an optional type is going to be one where we can say uh, either we've got a node or you've got none. And those are the only two options, right? So let's go ahead and define our class, which will be a class node. And it's going to have two attributes, a data attribute of type int and a next attribute of optional node, all right? And if we wanted to give a default value here, the default value could be none for this node and could be say zero for data, but we're going to create a constructor uh, that's going to allow us to initialize both of these attributes uh, as part of the construction process. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to define an init 
method or constructor that gets a reference to the new object that's being constructed and has parameters for each of these attributes that we want to initialize. So I've got my data parameter and my next parameter and notice those types match up such that we can now say, okay, self.data is data and self.next is next, right? And we've got a very simple uh, implementation of a singly linked list node here that has these two attributes in it. And why don't we go ahead and set up the example we were looking at before. One of the things that's going to be funky about working with a linked list is you kind of, a singly linked list in this way, is we kind of start with the back of our list and work our way forward, right? So let me just write out what we're trying to model. So it was 110 is one node and it's going to be followed by 210 and it's going to be followed by none. Right, so this will be our, our list. Okay, well, let's go ahead and set up this 210 node. As I said, we're, we tend to grow our lists from the back. And uh, I'm not even gonna set up a main function here. Let's just write this in the, in the global scope. So if we say our head node is going to be of uh, type node, we can construct a new node with a data property of 210 and a next value of none, all right? Okay, well, how do we then uh, set up the next node for 110? Well, we can reassign head to no longer be, uh, and actually, let me just update this diagram, and then we'll, we'll eventually look at what this looks like in a memory diagram in just a moment. So right now, if we were to imagine this program running after line 16, you know, I would have a variable named head in my, uh, in my globals frame, and it would refer to this, uh, this node object whose value is 210, and that node object would have a next of none. And then what we're gonna do is say, okay, you know what, actually assign to head another new node whose data is 110 and whose next is the previous, is what head was previously, right? And so this is what's ultimately going to, let me actually go ahead and make this look a little bit more like a memory diagram we would write. So node has a data attribute of 210 and a next, that is currently none, right? And sometimes you might see me write instead of none, just the, the, the null symbol or the nothing symbol. Uh, any of these is, is totally fine for our purposes, but technically this stores a none value in Python. Okay, that was the first line. So then this next line is saying, okay, go construct a new head, or sorry, go construct a new node. So that would ultimately set up a node. And in the constructor, we know that the data property would be 110 and the next property or the next attribute would be whatever head was in the global frame. So head was this reference to this node. So next is gonna be the reference to the node where the data attribute was 210, all right? And so now we've got that set up. And then when that constructor returns, what it would wind up returning is the, a reference to say, okay, make head no longer 210 but make head refer to this uh, node object where the data attribute was 110. And so these two lines set up this linked list where uh, the, the head node is a reference to the uh, object with a data attribute of 110, followed by uh, the data attribute of 210 for the next one, all right? And you can already tell this is way more cumbersome than working with a list directly, right? But this is gonna give us great practice for working with references and recursive algorithms. All right. So that's the base case of a recursive data type. Once one of your attributes that expects to refer to another node of the same type or another object of the same type uh, actually doesn't refer to any object at all, you reached your base case of a recursive data type. So what are some of the fundamental things that we can do with our linked list? Well, we've just seen we can construct a new node at the front of another list, right? We always need a next node, uh, a, a next reference, and that's going to be the start of another list. That might be the start of the empty list, right? And in, in, in the case of the first node that we constructed, this one here, that was the case. Notice we started a brand new list and we said, okay, we're making a new node, 210, and, and it's going to refer to the empty list next. But the second time we called the node constructor and we constructed a new node, uh, we have 110 being put uh, prepended onto is one way to think about it, 
uh, the linked list where the rest of the list was 210 and then the rest of that was the empty list. Okay. You can access the list's first value through the data attribute and you can access the rest of the list or the very next node through the next attribute. Right? So these are the three fundamental things that with these capabilities in our pocket, we'll be able to write recursive algorithms to process these linked lists uh, in, in a really neat way. From these three fundamental operations, we'll be able to build up more interesting algorithms. Uh, and that'll be the focus of uh, our first algorithm that's a recursive linked list algorithm counting the length of a, of a recursively defined linked list. And then we'll get practice with uh, these concepts as we move through the next exercise and the final exercise as well. So what does the count algorithm look like in counting the nodes of a linked list? How are we able to write a function that you give it the head of a list and it returns back to you the length of that list or the number of elements, the number of nodes in it? Well, let's try this with some pseudocode first. Let's write out the English of how we might expect to be able to process this recursively or define this recursively. And then we will uh, try and implement this pseudocode in actual code after. So here's the count algorithm. If the list is empty, then the count is zero, right? If, if we ask what's the, empty, the length of an empty list, it's zero, right? Otherwise, the count is one plus the count of the same algorithm applied to the rest of the list. And that's the recursive step here. That's the recursive uh, uh, call that's saying, okay, uh, if I'm not empty, then I know there's one, right? I know there's one and I don't know how many come after me. So let me just ask the next node to count itself and how many come after it, right? So let's try writing uh, this little recursive algorithm together, right? So in the same, demo uh, file, let's go ahead and define a function named count. And as an argument, it's going to take a, uh, let's call it a list of, uh, let's not use the word list. In Python, that's a, a special word. So let's let's actually use um, uh, a node. And it's going to be type optional node. And the reason for this is because we wanna be able to count an empty list, right? And we know that when we count an empty list, it's gonna return zero. What's the return type of this function? Well, it's gonna to return to us an integer. And how do we implement that pseudocode, All right? Well, if we think about it, that pseudocode said uh, one, if the list is empty, the count is zero. So, okay. If a node is equal to none, then return zero, right? Otherwise, we're going to do what? Well, we're gonna return one. So return one plus, and then we want to count the rest of the list, right? So count the rest of the list. How do we get the rest of the list? We say a node dot next, right? And there we go. We are have implemented a recursive algorithm and it seems pretty intuitive, right? It's saying, okay, you count a non-empty node and what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, okay, one plus, well, go count the rest. Right? and keep doing this until you reach the end. And when you reach the end, we know that there's zero and we uh, return back one plus whatever came after us each time. Okay, so if we wanted to, we could try um, printing uh, the result of count from head uh, after our very first node was added, right? And so that we would expect that to be one, right? We could also try uh, for testing purposes, printing none. Uh, and then lastly, why don't we try printing the count of head again, but this time, remember, we've updated uh, the head at, uh, variable to be the, the new node at the front of the list, which was uh, 110, all right? And so if this works, we should see uh, zero for the length of the empty list. And uh, here we're seeing, uh, we should see one because we have a, a node that the next attribute is none. And here we expect to see two. All right, so let's see if this works out. So I'm gonna run python-m lessons.ls43 linked list and none one, two. All right, so it seems like we've got this working. If we were to add another node onto the front of our list, you know, uh, maybe we could imagine a world where one of one was a course number and we're gonna say that's the new head, um, attach that on to, to the rest of the list and print count of, head now and that's going to count up to three right so 
one, two, three, and this seems like this is working recursively. So there are some rules that we can think about when we start writing algorithms to process a, a data structure. We always want to test to be sure uh, that this, if the structure is empty, then we've reached our base case, right? We, we have no more nodes to process after us. Otherwise, what we're going to do is process our current node and then recursively process the rest of the structure, right? So when we recursively uh, process the rest of a linked list that's singly linked like this, it's going to be the next node. If we were to do this on a tree, it would be you know, the left side and the right side. We would apply it to both. So we can uh, demonstrate this. And in this example in the slide deck, we see that it's a little bit different from what we just, uh, what we just implemented, but not meaningfully different. So uh, notice we're checking to see uh, first if the list is empty. That's our very first if statement. If head is none or if head is equal to none, either of those is fine. And then uh, with the recursive call, notice here we're actually storing this in a variable named after me. And we'll diagram the implication of that in just a moment. Otherwise, we're going to count how many nodes come after me by, by saying count the rest of this list, count head.next, and then return how many come after me plus one because I'm going to include myself in the count, right? And it's like we're asking kids to count off uh, as, as, as the list is being uh, processed, right? So how might we actually diagram this particular process? And uh, let's move through this relatively quickly, okay? So we've got our, uh, I'm actually going to uh, leave, just for the purposes of time, uh, this example winds up setting up two uh, nodes. So I'm going to wind up reusing this to say, okay, the first node uh, that we created, n0, is gonna have a value of 21. The second node is gonna have a value of 18. And uh, let me just set up the rest of my stack here. Okay, so stack, heap, and I'm gonna try and get through this really quickly. And I would encourage you to follow along with this as well. And actually, if you wanna pause the video here and see if you can trace this, that's not a bad uh, uh, way to go. And in fact, I'm gonna pause the video and come back once I've reached the point of uh, being able to call count here, okay? Okay. So I have reached the point of N0 and N1 being initialized. And for the purposes of my diagram, I went ahead and erased the constructor calls to the node init constructor in order to reach this point, right? But there would have been two constructor calls, right? To node hashtag init for setting up these two node objects, right? But really the focus of this video is on in this lesson is on how do we actually process this recursive function called a count, right? And I'm going to change colors to yellow for the part that is uh, actually tracing the important step here. Your diagram would have had constructor frames for the two nodes. Uh, I've gone ahead and erased them. You should leave them on your diagram. So I'm going to put dot 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 here, right? And uh, constructors. Okay. So this called a count is going to set up a frame, right? And the return address is line 23, right? And our parameter for count is going to be named head in this example. It's a little different than we used in our sample code, right? So what is head going to be? Well, this count function call occurred when we were working in the globals frame and we gave it what is n1. Well, n1 is a reference to the node where data is 18, all right? So uh, now I'm going to draw an arrow to the node where the data attribute is 18, okay? And uh, that's the only parameter to set up in this function call frame. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this function call. And we ask, is head none? Well, no, head is a reference to uh, a node, so it's not none. And else we're saying, okay, here's our recursive step. And that's ultimately going to return something that initializes a variable named after me, but we'll come back to that. So let's go ahead and take care of the right-hand side of this initialization statement uh, immediately. So we're counting head.next. What is head.next? So head is this reference to the node whose data is 18, and next is this reference to the uh, node whose value is 21. So this next called a count 
is going to set up a return address that's different from the first called account, right? So this was the function call that we're processing. It happened on line 17, right? And head.next is going to be assigned to the head parameter of this frame. And remember, the current frame that this function call occurred in was uh, the frame where head is the node whose data attribute is 18, and next is this reference to, and I'm just going to draw this in the same way so that we can kind of get the intuition that this call where head.next is what's used is going to give us back a reference to the node whose data attribute is 21. Okay, so our frame is set up. We jump in to this function call and we go back to the top and we ask, is head none? No, uh, it's a head in this frame. So now we're working in the frame where head refers to the node whose data attribute is 21. So that's not true. So then we reach another recursive function call, right? And so here we're saying, okay, we'll call count one more time. So we set up another call to count and the return address is line 17. And what is this argument going to be? Well, head in the frame that we're coming from dot next is none, right? So head in this third frame or this third time we reach the function call is none. And that's all we need to do to set up this last call to the count function. So count gets called head is none. And now when we ask in the current frame, is head none? Yes, that's true this time around, right? So we return zero, return value of zero. And where do we return zero to? Well, we return zero back to line 17 when we were working in the frame just before it, all right? So now we're saying, okay, that call to count was zero and that's going to be assigned to a variable named after me. So after me, and I'm al alighting the underscore there for space purposes is zero. Okay, so now we reach a return statement for this call to count, which says return after me plus one. Well, after me is zero. So the return value of this frame is going to be one, right? So we're returning uh, this evaluated to just one. We're returning one to where? Well, we're returning one to line 17, which is where the return address was for this frame. But notice that since we returned from this frame, we're now going to be working in the frame uh, where head was had a value of 18 uh, and the return address was line 23. And so that call that uh, just evaluated had the return value of one. One is going to be assigned to after me. Well, which frame are we working in? Our current frame is the frame which hasn't yet returned. It's, it's this one, right? So we just returned one back to this frame. So after me just got initialized in this frame for the count function call to be one. And now we reach this return statement. This return statement is returned after me from this frame. So one plus one is two. Where are we returning two to? We're returning two to line 23. Well, line 23 was our initial call to count, right? This is where this recursive process began. So we return uh, two to this line and that's what printed out two ultimately. So the output here was two. This was printing out the uh, list of a length two, but I should have said the return value was two, right? So that returned two to line 23, that printed there, and then our program finished up, all right? So notice that we began the call to count with a reference to our head node, whose data was 18, and then it led to a recursive call to the next node, which led to a recursive call to the tail, which was none, the end of our list. And then those recursive functions uh, calls returned values back up, right? So we, we were in globals, we call count, we call count, we call count, those were recursive, then we return back a value, we return back a value, and then finally we return back a final value to uh, where this function call began in the stack, uh, in the globals frame in this example. So this is a uh, quick tracing of a, an example of a recursive process applied to a list. In this video, we looked at recursive data structures in Python by focusing on the simplest form of, recursive data, of a recursive data structure called a singly linked list. And the emphasis of what we're looking at in this sort of set of exercises and, and what we're focused on this week is how do we write algorithms like that count algorithm?
Another one might be, how do we write something that tells us whether or not some value is actually uh, assigned to one of the data attributes in our list? How can we know whether 110 was in our list or not? And so we'll look at that in an upcoming lesson, as well as some other algorithms that will be uh, as part of the final set of exercises for the course. Recursive data structures and algorithms take some time to get comfortable with, but if we focus first on how do we know when we're done with the job, and then how do we process one node at a time, and then leave the rest of processing to the recursive algorithm itself, we'll, we'll see that there are some common strategies that we can apply for making this a much uh, easier to understand uh, form of, of writing code and paradigm for solving problems and representing.